Could you outline for us what the story of Ressentiment is? People have described it as an intellectual history, but I'm really actually interested in emotions. Mm -hmm. And Ressentiment is a, is a powerful emotion, one that has been identified with the world we live in, with the modern world, right from, its, right from the inception of the modern world. So yeah. right from the 18th century onwards, as uh, we move away from the authority of the church and the monarchy and start to devise societies for the new kind of human being to inhabit, the secular human being to inhabit. We start talking about equality. Ressentiment, something that is innate in the nature of societies that are built upon the principle of equality, that promise equality to all its members. At the same time, those societies are highly unequal. And there exists in those societies a kind of structural inequality that is almost impossible to eradicate. But at the same time, its highest principles, its highest principle is equality. And ressentiment emerges from this collision between ideal and reality. When large numbers of people are aspiring for equality, and increasingly in the last um, 30 years or so since the end of the Cold War, um, they have sought equality in a state of prosperity. Uh, that has been another kind of great ideal held up around the world. And uh, I think a lot of ressentiment that emerges today is of people who feel not only left behind economically um, of losing out on opportunity for social mobility or, or suffering from uh, lower income um, and seeing wealthy people flourish, but it's also a res resentment of people who they think have more political and cultural capital who have managed to make their own preferences prevail mm -hmm. and become uh, sort of dominant goals of that particular society. And they have, in mind, by the way, people like you and I, yeah. who have monopolized unfairly all kinds of uh, cultural and intellectual capital and have, yes. and have managed to basically make our own <laughs> self-interest blend with collective welfare. So Ressentiment was kind of a, an angry yawp of resistance to, to change in which you don't feel you have a stake. Is that kind of broadly...? That is, that is broadly it. And I think the philosopher who first identified it is Rousseau. Yes. Um, right when the principles of the modern world were being formulated, uh, he said that this is really a problem. It's kind of opening up a huge source of discord within the human soul. Yes. Um, and that this new society that we are trying to build and entering very fast, this commercial society built around the ideas of self-interest and mimicry, yes. of, of mimicking people who are rich, wanting, craving their privileges, that this would create a permanent source of suffering inside people's souls. Interesting. A critique which is, again, you know, all through the 19th century, expressed by a variety of people, including yes. uh, Tocqueville and Kierkegaard, and, 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 and Nietzsche, of course, has his own spin on this. Dostoevsky, of course, is the yes. greatest master of of ressentiment. Yes. So I was going to come on to Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau because you make an interesting contrast with Voltaire and I think this is a contrast that was made by Nietzsche. But the, the comparison that's made is between Rousseau as the sort of plebeian outsider and Voltaire as the man of commercial society, worldly power, influence, high culture. And straight away we're into a, a sort of almost classical populist formulation of the, the elite versus, versus the outsider. Is this what attracted you to that contrast between those, those two figures? Uh, and I started thinking about this after um, Narendra Modi was elected prime minister in India in 2014. And he emerged uh, in, in very much in the, in the way Trump did by scorning, by openly disdaining the English-speaking metropolitan elite of India. Yeah and saying, this elite does not care for us. And we need to essentially overthrow this elite. It's corrupt, it's self-serving, it's mendacious. Mm. And uh, it's really been eerie to watch the same rhetoric being echoed by people here yes. uh, in, 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 during the Brexit campaign and also in the United States. I think my initial uh, intuition uh, in 2014 that there is you know a lot to be explored in this particular polarity that Nietzsche identified between Voltaire and Rousseau since we are living in a world where the older distinctions of left and right um, have ceased to matter yes. liberal conservative has ceased to matter yes. 
And I think the biggest political oppositions that we see now really are between an elite that is seen, uh, correctly or not, uh, as having basically monopolized um, the, the, the best places for themselves and, and the best fruits for themselves. Post-1945, um, if you look at Europe, and uh, this, this Princeton scholar, uh, Jan Werner Muller, actually wrote brilliantly about this. He pointed out that you know, most post-1945 European constitutions or political systems were really informed by a fear of the masses because what had happened previously had uh, really turned into a cautionary tale for um, you know, these sort of post-war builders of Europe that we cannot entrust the masses with you know the kind of political decisions they were making early on, which were catastrophic, um, you know, voting in demagogues or certainly giving them a lot of mass support. So there has always been that fear of mass democracy, and you know we know that all through the 19th century it was actually suppressed. In in our in our own time, we've kind of seen many contradictory tendencies. We've seen the weakening of sovereignty of of nation states, a kind of virtual equality that digital technology has uh, enabled where people feel empowered to say anything to anyone um, in public, on social media. In a way, um, it's, a, it's a poor substitute for the kind of equality that they actually want. Yes. You know, essentially, they want an end to their own suffering, their inner suffering, yes. but you know, right now, they're kind of just projecting it, it outwards.